Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation and everything. And I'll warn you, you'll get sick of me in the next couple of days. Um, so we changed the schedule a little bit. It was supposed to be, so Julia's, I kidnapped Julia's last lecture, basically. Um, so I'm going to give a bunch of lectures on beyond endoscopy and a certain aspect of beyond endoscopy. I thought about how to actually approach this. Um, I thought a lot. <laughs> So eventually I decided on the following. So I will, parts of this lecture series is gonna be actually technical. So I apologize for that, but I think technicality is a part of the, uh, the business, so it cannot be avoided. And as you avoid, you don't convey the information, so I will actually do some technical details. You're free to leave when it happens. <laughs> um, but here is a rough plan of what I'm thinking. So let's put this over here. So, by the way, how, how big am I supposed to write? Is this visible from, no, from take, the back? Take blue or, take blue or black. Take blue or black, Not, no, no red. But I like <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, uh, okay, a little bit bigger. So, Rough outline. So these are not necessarily divided in terms of lecture one, lecture two by basis, but uh, roughly topic by topic. So I'm going to start with an introduction, a very gentle one, and I'm not going to go very uh, deep into the introduction because it's kind of like a, a, a swamp. Uh, the more you go deep in, the harder to get out. Uh, once I talk about the introduction to beyond endoscopy, I'll basically set up the problem that I want to discuss. And once the problem is set up, I'll talk about a couple of uh, difficulties that arise in general for the general problem. And so here is what I decided to do different than what I usually do. I'm going to actually avoid all of these problems at first, and for a couple of lectures, I'll just talk about GL2 and the Eichler-Selberg Selberg trace formula. I, sorry. He warned me that he's actually uh, correcting everybody's small mistakes, so I'm expecting all of this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about eichler selberg trace formula. In particular, I'm going to talk about a very particular case of beyond endoscopy. And I'll hopefully try to uh, highlight certain peculiar uh, peculiarities and difficulties here. A part of the general difficulties don't arise here, so you could actually go straight down into uh, the main problem, so to speak. That's why I wanted to do it in this order. So uh, there will be certain discussion of issues. Then I'll go back and talk about these difficulties. This in a slightly more general case, more general setting. And there, I will basically allow a more general test function in the trace formula than what is allowed in the eichler selberg case. And once that is done, uh, you may have heard of a well, somewhat famous paper of Langlands, Frankel, and Nigo, where they actually try to, they, they have an approach for these uh, type of problems. I'll compare our approach, so I'll comparison with this. And I'll say what they get, what we get, and why we get more, why they get what they get, so to speak. And the last part, I will basically talk about uh, uh, some future directions. And future directions, this includes um, certain suggestions of Arthur, so conjectures of Arthur, and certain, well, maybe, uh, I should say Jacques Zaghi approach that I believe 
will actually be uh, useful. So this is roughly what I have in mind. So what you should get, what you should take from this is, once I introduce the setup, I'll basically move down to eichler selberg trace formula immediately. I think that was introduced, so I'll use the eichler selberg trace formula right on the spot. So in the meanwhile, please stop, ask questions, anything. Uh, I may be jet lagged, so I may not make sense, just stop me. So anyways, um, let's start. One. So introduction. Man, you are tough, huh? Okay, everybody but Mr. Castleman. <laughs> I'm sorry? Introduction. Okay, okay, intro. Okay, I think this makes introduction. Okay, sorry. This is not going to be the main theme of the talk, so. I think we're okay. So everything starts with uh, Langland's basically functoriality conjectures. I am sure everybody has written this a million times. So this was introduced in the famous paper, well, famous letter of Langland's, I believe 1967. And it roughly says the following. So suppose you give yourself, I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be basically rough formulation. It takes two groups, H and G. I'm going to take them to be quasi-split to avoid everything. And over Q, I don't want to deal with number fields, but it is, of course, much more general than this. And we give ourselves a map, a nice map, between their dual groups. So this is a, uh, well, what is called an L-homomorphism. And let me remind you, this HL group right here is a dual group. It's a connected algebraic group over C. And well, it has a semi-direct with this Galois. Sometimes this is Vey, sometimes this is Galois. For us, since I'll be working with GLN mostly, these, this semi-direct product is not going to matter. But for this kind of scenario, basically what functoriality it predicts is a transfer or well, a transfer of packets. Let me put this in parentheses uh, of automorphic representations of H to those of G. Okay, how far down can you see? Everything good? Okay. So, I mean, as the way I stated it, it is content free at the moment. You could send all of your packets to the same element. So this satisfies, this is such that, let's say, uh, the following holds, which will be, so I'm gonna start with this, ls i g of rho should be L S pi uh, H of rho of sigma. All right, so what is happening here? So pi H is basically the packet, or l let me just stick to representations here. Pi H is going to pi G uh, under the sigma. Well, whatever that means. So the sigma is a map. And here rho is a representation of the dual group of G, it's a finite dimensional complex representation. So this has to be satisfied. What is this LS, uh, S pi? And S is once and for all fixed, for all fixed in this game, set of finite places, including infinity, 
I'm only talking about Q. And this pi h and pi g are unramified outside of S, so this, these representations are unramified. outside of S. So I'm stating in this form because I'm going to use this partial L functions. You can actually state it in a more general form which actually has the whole L function, but I'm not going to need it. Uh, the, the reason is it is believed or it is expected that the analytic properties of the full L function is actually re reflected already in the partial L function. So I'll only be talking about the partial L function. And what does unramified mean? It means the maximal compact of, well, you fix a hyperspecial maximal compact, and that guy actually has a fixed vector. But uh, forget about that. What, we, what do we need for these, maybe recall, uh, for pi unramified, pi v unramified. So let me just fix this. So pi is the restricted tensor product of pi v's over V, and this will be a part in S, tensor, a part not in S. And this pi V is unramified. For this unramified guy, there is what is known as a Satake parameter, a conjugacy class, semi-simple conjugacy class in GL attached to this. So now I'm talking about, like, say, pi is pi is an automorphic representation of G. So for each one of these guys, there is a semi-simple conjugacy class in GL that is attached to this. I'm also going through this introduction so that I can fix some notation. So this conjugacy class, once and for all, I'll be so I'll call a pi v, so this is the Satake parameter, attached to pi. And finally, the L function is just the product over all of these things that are not an S of the characteristic polynomial or roughly the characteristic polynomial, so rho of A of pi V over Q V to the S inverse. Okay, so we're basically taking the uh, determinant of identity minus rho of A pi V, and I am going to write this quite often as a Dirichlet series, and this will be my notation, and from one to infinity, um, A, pi comma rho of n over n to the s, and here n and the big set, the set capital S is relatively prime. So this basically would mean I'm taking all these n's that are relatively prime to every prime in s prime, and a pi rho of n is the corresponding coefficient. Make sense? All right. So, okay. There are more compatibilities in this, but like this will be the actual defined, this will be the important relation, so maybe I should. Am I really not allowed to use the uh, red at all, or can I like, you know, maybe do this? That, that's, that's, I think, okay. Well, it's not that important anyways. <laughs> Okay, so functoriality basically says this. As long as we have a map, like sigma, like a nice map, then we have the corresponding equality of L functions. Well, how to prove functoriality is uh, quite a challenging thing. So I'm gonna, because of lack of space, I'm gonna erase all this. So maybe before I go in, actually, maybe I'll give you a couple of examples of these L functions and what they look like. Because we'll be using them quite often, so it's good to have playground. So, I mean, of course, it's not that easy to write L automorphic L functions simply because it's not that easy to write the Satake parameters of these guys, at least in general. 
But there are a couple of cases where we can do better. For instance, so there's one representation that qu quite often appears in this, in this game. Okay, let me do this, like colors. Example. Um, let me take G to be GLN, or GL, even GL, do I want GLN or GL2? Well, let me take, uh, GL2, and pi to be the trivial representation of Well, this is just literally the trivial representation. It is fairly automorphic. Um, then, consider the following, ls pi. So this is unramified everywhere, so I don't actually have to put anything. Uh, when I say ls pi, I just mean I take the standard representation rho of GL2 into GL2. So it's just like mapping GL2, any matrix to itself. And in this case, this is nothing but the product of, uh, well, over V, of, well, determinant of the following guy, identity minus um, QV to the one half, QV to the minus a half, what is that? Well, I just said it. It's standard. <laughs> so rho is standard. So, or maybe, let me just write it this way. Identity. Um, just identity doesn't mean that it's easy. <laughs> But uh, in this case, it is fairly trivial. So this is the guy, and as you can see, this is just zeta of uh, s plus a half times zeta of s minus a half. And moreover, you could actually do this for uh, GLN. You're gonna get a bunch of products of uh, zeta factors like this up to not one half, but m minus a, n over two minus one, I believe. Um, but what one needs to uh, realize here is the following that I want to actually emphasize. So note, or remark, that this guy has a pole at s equals 3 halves because of this, OK? So this is quite unusual for automorphic L functions. Co compare the situation with GL1's case. Uh, the Dirichlet L functions for non-trivial characters, they actually are holomorphic. But the zeta, Riemann zeta, actually sticks out, and this is the exact same reincarnation of that fact in GL2. Um, and these are the uh, Sataki parameters in that case. So with that example, so we could also do a little bit of a more abstract example. Again, if G is, well, this time GLN, let's say, uh, and pi cuspidal, Automorphic. Well, now I can't really be this explicit, but what is known is, so maybe I should write fact, this ls pi is holomorphic in real s greater than, well, actually greater than or equal to one, but well, has analytic continuation, etc. and a functional equation. So in other words, this, is, this doesn't have a pole, whereas the corresponding counterpart in the identity the trivial representation actually does have a pole. So there is something interesting going on a little bit. Well, when we look at this, we see, well, the difference between the trivial representation and these cuspidal guys is that trivial representation is not cuspidal. So somehow, there is a distinction in how their automorphic representations behave. So for non-cuspidal guys, at the very least for this, there is a pole to the right of the uh, real s equals one line. This is, for future reference, a, um, a sign that the representation that you started with is actually not tampered, whatever that may mean. But, okay, these are standard L functions, so let's uh, move rho a little bit more. So let's move rho around. 
Uh, maybe example one continued. Well, GL2 doesn't have that many representations, but uh, I could take rho to be the symmetric kth power representation of GL2 to uh, GL k plus 1. And what does that guy do to this parameter? It basically takes that, I hope this is correct, so it uh, moves it to QV to uh, K over 2, K over 2 minus 1, and QV to minus K over 2, I think. Um, so the, in this case, LS pi rho, well, sorry, LS pi rho becomes a product of zeta functions, but now zetas are twisted all along, so uh, it's going to be a product of i equals 0 to k of zeta of s plus k by 2 minus i. So in particular, this will have a pole. Let's see where the first pole appears. Uh, so when this thing is has a pole, well, it has many poles, actually, but the uh, at s equals so this thing has to be 1, so uh, 1 plus k over 2, I believe. So basically, let me put a diagram here. Here is 0, here is 1, which we usually are interested in in the theory of L functions. So for the symmetric first power, the first pole appeared at 3 halves. For the symmetric kth power, we, we're already like pretty far off, actually. So this is quite non-tempered. This is actually, it's a fact that this is the most non-tempered guy in the spectrum. Um, in any case, so basically, what I want to emphasize at this point at the introduction is that as rho gets more complicated, the automorphic L function significantly changes behavior and its analytic behavior. Okay, so, so far so good. What else, actually? Maybe uh, another. I promise, the last example. What's that? Yeah, that's minus k, k over 2. Isn't it the first pole? What's the... Uh, I mean, there are poles all over the place. Like, you know, there's w one pole at each... But uh, all I want is the rightmost pole for now. Like. If it makes it happier, there's one here, one here, one here. OK. So the final example, I was going to be a little bit more uh, explicit about this. But basically, there are these. So what one can do is, this is a rough construction. One can start with a quadratic extension E over Q and take an Adele class character of AE which maps to C star. And let me take it to be trivial on, well, actually, just, just take this, and take it to be trivial on um, when it's restricted to, well, AQ. You know, they certainly exist. And what one could do is what is called an automorphic induction. And, well, this is not that easy. In a sense, it is very easy to explain. It's actually, a, you basically construct a theta function starting with this, and that would actually be a uh, GL2 automorphic form. And there is an L function attached to this GL2 automorphic form, which is exactly the L function of this character over E. So what one could do, let me uh, just, uh, so automorphic induction, let me be a little bit vague here, uh, gives a GL2 automorphic form, pi chi. This guy is cuspidal in most of the cases, at least. Most of the cases. And moreover, I'm going to say, so cuspidal means by this example number two, it's standard L function is holomorphic. So this means 
L S pi is holomorphic. Everywhere, actually. However, if I've done the calculation correctly, something weird happens when you actually look at a symmetric square L function, but L S pi chi and sim two, I believe, is L E of S chi squared times zeta of S. I think. If I let's see. I think so. Um, I believe so. So in, in any case, the, uh, so it's a, at least a degree three L function, so that's good. Uh, so in other words, although pi chi actually was holomorphic, the L function, L S pi chi was holomorphic, and now I'm gonna write standard here just to emphasize that we're looking at the uh, standard L function was holomorphic This LS pi chi sim 2 had a pole, has a pole at S equals 1. So this is basically saying, if we think about this uh, row map as actually mapping GL2 to GL3, there should be, by functoriality, a corresponding automorphic L function on GL3, and that guy should actually be not very behaving well. But this basically is at the heart of, this phenomena is at the heart of uh, the beyond endoscopy proposal, which I will explain now. So if, just to recap what happened, at least for GLN, cuspidal automorphic L functions are holomorphic, however, that's no guarantee that, like standard L functions, the higher representations would actually give holomorphic objects. And that actually tells us something about the uh, automorphic representation that we are dealing with. So this actually tells us something about pi chi. In order to describe that, let me assume, so to describe this, in this whole theory, one expects a parametrization of automorphic L, automorphic uh, representations by maps from a hypothetical, so this is a hypothetical, hypothetical automorphic Galois group Galois group to our L group. So for each pi, basically, there should be a corresponding map. So the sigma should cor correspond to a pi, basically pi sigma maybe. Okay, what this construction is saying is the following. So this pi chi that I constructed from an Adele class character, in a sense, this belonged to GL1. Because, I mean, think about this as GL1 of E, well, AE at least, mod GL1 of E. And essentially, what is going on here is this pi chi that I constructed comes from a map to GL1 first, and then an induction from this guy. So in a sense, it factors through. So it doesn't actually, this is now GL2. So it doesn't actually belong to GL2 to start with. And what this automorphic L function, the uh, pole of the automorphic L function is telling us, or at least like hinting at us, is this fact that the symmetric square L function of this particular guy has a pole simply because it actually factors through GL1. 
anything that actually factors in this case will actually have a pole. And this is in general. So expectation, let me say. In general, poles of automorphic L functions are expected to determine functorial transfers. So note that these are all happening in the dual level. So this is this is basically an example of a functorial transfer. It's called the, the induction. But in general, this is actually uh, expected to happen. In other words, basically, in other words, uh, for any pi, I'm going to call this pi h, such that, uh, well, pi g, let me say, pi g, such that there exists an h l mapping to g l and pi h is mapping to pi g. So suppose your pi g actually comes as a functorial transfer, then one expects, one expects to be able to find a, a representation rho of the dual group into some finite dimensional vector space such that such that the uh, Automorphic L function LS, this is now partial, LS pi G comma rho has a pole. Pole at S equals one. So this is a very rough formulation, but like this is at the heart of it. Basically, the problem with proving func functoriality or one of the pro problems with proving functoriality is it's very hard to isolate the image of a functorial transfer. Like suppose I'm looking at I mean, even, even in the case of uh, just standard maps, like orthogonal groups mapping into GL, GLN, or symplectic groups mapping into GLN just by the identity map, it's not that easy to actually isolate the, um, the image of the functorial transfer. And let alone, in those cases, the image is large, so one can actually use certain involutions and stuff, but like for a general functorial transfer, like a general map, say, in GL2 to GLK plus one that we were considering over there, the symmetric kth power, we're basically mapping a small, small, like think about this as the automorphic spectrum, and GL2's automorphic spectrum is obviously smaller than the GLK plus one's automorphic spectrum. We are mapping it into the automorphic spectrum in GLK plus one in a very nonlinear way, so to speak. And somehow we're trying to isolate those representations that are actually transfers from GL2. That's not the very easy question. And Langland's idea was basically to use these automorphic L functions as gadget to detect these functorial transfers. So what did he want to do? He wanted to basically say the following. But by the way, maybe I should stop for a second and make this a little bit more precise. OK, so remarks about this, this statement. Remark number one is in order to actually basically s phrase what I'm trying to say as a pole at s equals one, I need to take pi to be what is called of Ramanujan type. So implicitly, and this is going to come up in a second, implicitly we are taking pi to be of 
what is called Ramanujan type. And Ramanujan type means the following. I'm going to just say this and not write it. This basically says that it satisfies the Ramanujan conjectures at every local place. In other words, these Sataki parameters, AV, are unitary, so they're of absolute value one at each, each and every place. So in particular, this guy is not of Ramanujan type. So this is not of Ramanujan type. Um, on the other hand, this is, because, I mean, these are just characters, and if you assume that, uh, well, at least a twist of it is, uh, because these are just like Dirichlet the characters, essentially. So, in particular, if you actually have representations that are not of Ramanujan type, then poles of automorphic L functions, there's no reason they would only appear at one. They can appear further to the right, like as it happened right here. Okay, so this is number one. Maybe number two is how can you assume that like, they're of Ramanujan type? How do you isolate things that are of Ramanujan type? Well, it's expected that, it's expected that, um, well, those pi that are not of Ramanujan type, type can be handled, let me say, handled inductively. In other words, they correspond to uh, certain, there's an inductive characterization of those things that actually give non-Ramanujan type uh, automorphic representations. So after all this uh, maybe one more remark. The last remark is the following. For those of Ramanujan type, one also expects the following. So if we denote uh, by m pi rho to be the order of the pole of ls pi rho at s equals 1, then what one expects is this m pi rho to be equal to the multiplicity of the trivial representation on the sigma of h uh, rho restricted to sigma of h. So remember, the scenario that uh, we are taking is the following. So HL is mapping into GL with sigma. I'll assume that sigma to be faithful to avoid certain complications. What's that? Sigma. HL, sorry. Yeah. And then we have rho. So what happens is this guy has an image, which may or may not be the whole group, and it mostly will not be the whole group. And then we have the sigma of HL. And you restrict this guy to uh, your image, and this may control, con this may have the trivial representation in it of sigma of HL, well, HL in this case. Uh, and then you basically count the number of times that uh, this representation actually has the trivial representation of H. And this is uh, so. In other words, we should be able to basically tell what the order of the pole of the cell function is just purely by looking at the uh, the Langlands parameters of the uh, the L function. I mean, in this case, the Langlands parameters are going to look like, for instance, the following: chi, chi, sigma. If this well, chi v maybe if v is split, and it will be one chi w if w is inert. And the thing is, when you take the symmetric square, the parameters are going to look like chi v squared, chi 2 sigma, and here there will be a, well, norm, basically. Well, there will be 1 here. And then here there will be 1 chi w and chi w squared, I believe. And this guy will be fixed, because I'm also assuming that the q embedded in, uh, so this, this will be. Chi v, chi v, 
sigma. So I'm assuming that chi is trivial on the embedded Q that will make this fixed guy to actually contribute to uh, the pole. I mean, but that's, that, that's an exercise basically in uh, class field theory. Okay, let me move over here. Okay, so any questions so far? Because I'm gonna just write it up here. Which one? It's chi, chi, w, chi V. Oh, it's in the video. Okay, good, great. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't escape. <laughs> it is in the video, that is true. So I'm gonna, now, after all this, at the very least, if there's no question, just take the, uh, like what we should have in our minds is automorphic L functions, at least their poles, are, can be maybe used as detecting functorial transfers. And that is what Langlands Beyond Net Scopic Proposal is, so BE proposal. Can one, well, it has two steps. Step one, can we write a trace formula that looks like the following. This is going to be a sum over pi's of Ramanujan type. So everything is now happening over G, okay? And I'm going to fix a row, which will be a dual group representation. And I'm gonna fix an S, so these are both fixed. So S will be fixed, I'll be only looking at representations that are unramified outside of S. Well, there will be a multiplicity because these things actually appear with multiplicity, and well, they may, at least, m pi of rho, times, well, trace formula comes with a, a choice of a test function. So inside S, I'm just like whatever it is, and outside S, I'd like to basically weigh this bit m pi rho. So this is the multiplicity of the pole of the automorphic L function at S equals one, there are s several things that I will talk about before, but I want my red pen first. So what this should basically tell us is the following. This should in principle be counting those automorphic forms that are lifts or transfers from those H for which this one, uh, which would contain the trivial representation of H in rho. So that is basically talk like, and think about it, well rho, let me just take rho to be irreducible here. A couple of remarks here. When rho is irreducible, if H is not an automorphic, not a functorial transfer, then obviously it is not going to contain the trivial representation, so this will be zero. So things that are not functorial transfers should in principle not contribute to this unless rho is of special type. So on the other hand, if rho is a functorial transfer from an H for which this multiplicity is non-zero, then it should all contribute. Now there are subtleties about this, yep. What's that? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, yep. <laughs> 12 is equal to, <laughs> it, it is a formula after all, it's not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not lying that bad. <laughs> it will be a formula. So for each, for each test function fs, it should give you a formula, a workable expression for this quantity on the right hand side. So that is what it should be doing. Yes. Again, I told you. <laughs> it's the multiplicity of pi. M pi is the order of pole, and mu pi is the multiplicity. I mean, there are so many unfortunate coincidences of notation here, so uh, this will be one for GLN, so you can ignore this. And I will not talk about anything but GLN, mostly. 
Okay, so, oh, and then step number two is, well, step one is this. Well, maybe step number one and a half is to do this for a lot of rows so that you can isolate those H's that these things are actually coming from. Uh, and then step two is to compare this type of formula to the trace formula on individual H's themselves to actually establish functorial transfers. Because this would basically tell you, give you a candidate set of lifts, like candidate set of automorphic representations of G that are in the image of the functorial transfer. But you don't know that until you can actually compare it with the corresponding H that these things are supposed to be coming from. But, oh yeah. So that is, all right, question. Oops, this is not the right color for the question. So question, can we attach and can I do it on the other side, the dual side, H, pi, H lambda maybe, like HL pi to a given pi. So this is actually a very subtle question, so I was not sure if I wanted to talk about this. The answer is yes and no. Um, so it certainly is no, it's, at best it could be a conjugacy class, but even the conjugacy class may not be well defined. So let me just uh, give a couple of things. So maybe a more concrete version of this question is the following. Suppose, maybe concretely, Suppose we have uh, a map, HL to GL. Suppose, suppose we have this. And we know, we only know, these multiplicities of the trivial representation of HL uh, in well, various rows. Row. Uh, restricted to HL for, well, essentially all HL, uh, all rows. How unique can this data determine HL in, the con in, in GL? So it is a subtle question. If HL is semi-simple and simply connected, I believe it's determined up to conjugacy. And that is a result of Larson and Pink. But if it is not semi-simple, it is not determined up to conjugacy. It may not be, at least. And in GL, so there are, there's work of um, Yun in, oh, sorry, I actually have Wu in, well, there is recent work actually that uh, specializes in this, like, you know, how, how uniquely can this be uh, determined. And they actually have one, as far as I understand, one set of counterexamples that basically captures all the cases where it is not uniquely determined, and they kind of understand why it is not uniquely determined. There's some connectedness issue. Yeah. Oh, he's here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't see him right now here, but... Uh-huh. I didn't... I think that's a joint work, though. Is it, is it just his? All right. So it is, it is a subtle question, but there is certain, uh, there is a way to actually capture a certain, maybe conjugacy classes plus finitely many disconnected. There's only finitely many for each possibility. So even if it is, its conjugacy class may not be uniquely determined, there's only finitely many conjugacy classes that it can happen. And as far as I understand, that is actually related to this multiplicity of the uh, automorphic representation appearing. But for all practical purposes, I'll basically take this for GLN to be a fairly well-defined object. I usually only finitely many of these representations is enough. Well, I mean, for all of them, only finitely many is enough, but you need to go further down in these rows. Like, how many rows can one take to determine this pi h? For GL2, for instance, there are not that many uh, subgroups. There are tori, and there are finite subgroups of GL2. 
And as long as one knows the, these multiplicities up to symmetric 12th power, you can actually detect which one is which. Any other question? Okay, so the question is, well, this is just step one again, but I will only consider step one, so I will only talk about step one. Yes, step two, so step two is compare this and this just, the simple word compare has a lot going on in it. Compare this data, or this formula, with that of the trace formula or formulae in of H's or HL's in that case. So remember, this is basically for each given pi if, okay, so this is step two, to establish functorial transfers. And what I skipped is step one and a half, <laughs> and that was the question. The thing is, so you write this formula, this basically tells you, uh, gives you an idea to which pi's are, or, lifts of the following sort. So this, once you have these mu pi, so this formula for mu pi, trace of f pi s, f s of m pi rho, so you vary pi, uh, vary rho, this should isolate these hls, in, in theory at least, in theory. So Basically, what you're looking for is a formula like this, a sum over various different embeddings of groups, let's say faithful, so there are finally many of these things, and those pi's, pi g's, that are transfers from this pi h, from h, of this mu pi g, of trace of uh, pi g s of f s times this, like, I mean, let me just leave it at this form. Even this is not great because there can be actually multiple counts here. My von pi h can actually map into an h2 and then an h2 can be mapped. So there's some alternating sum that is going on here. So I'm gonna just put this as a as an alternative. And then you would like to compare this guy with the corresponding trace formula on the H's. But this is uh, a basically a light year away at the moment, so I'm, I'll stick to step one. So at the end, I'll, I'll end this lecture by setting up the problem very concretely. So this was uh, essentially the motivation, more, like morally what we are aiming for. But the trace formula, this, I would like to focus on now what one expects actually, or how to get a formula that calculates these quantities. So maybe a little bit of a digression. So there are two issues here. One is we're talking about the order of a pole of an automorphic L function. Number one, we don't even know if this automorphic L function actually makes sense at s equals one. Quite often we don't. So we need an alternative definition for this pole. So something that would actually capture this pole but we actually know exists and we can write down. And there, the following tool actually comes in handy. So if, all right, I'm gonna basically, okay, if, D of S is just any Dirichlet series. Is, well, analytic. 
in real S, say, in some large open half plane, and has continuation to, well, I'm going to say around S equals 1. So it's like a, so here is S equals 1. I, all I want is something like this. And you can actually avoid this. You can just like, as long as you can continue it, you can extend the uh, definition to real S equals 1 line right here, then you're, you'll be in business for what I'm going to say. Uh, and that, well, I'm going to say two things. Forget about this. If this is true, then the sum, the partial averages of this. Oops. So you look at the coefficient of n in the Dirichlet series, and you basically sum these things up to a large parameter x. If you could do the following, if you could say that this is, like, say, a constant times x plus little o of x, for instance, then this would basically implies, imply that the residue of this function d of s at s equals 1 is just the c. And this is a very particular case of what one would expect, and there are no poles, and that there are no other poles. Um, in real s greater than 1. So basically, if you have an L function that is mildly behaving, like nicely behaving, and it has analytic, pro like analytic continuation to roughly a little bit to the left, then partial averages give information about poles. And moreover, if it has other poles, like to the right of s equals 1, say s equals 3 halves, the exponent of this guy is going to change. And uh, then this is that. Moreover, the pole is simple. The pole is simple. I mean, these are all simplifying assumptions that I'm putting, but like in general, what's going to happen is you're going to get an expression which looks like, okay, in general, in general, if d of s has a pole at s equals, say, I don't know, alpha, which is like greater than 1, like, then this guy is going to give an x to the alpha sum i equals 0 to m, I, my, my m minus 1 of x to m log I, A, B, I's. In other words, okay, so alpha, oops, this is alpha, so I, I mean this is alpha. So basically here is your pole, which is like alpha, of order M. Then you're going to get a term of size x alpha, and then up till the mth, like basically you'll get uh, certain log factors. So it's a poly like a log polynomial, so to speak. So in other words, these partial averages will capture everything about these, and these bi's are uh, certain complicated combinations of the Laurent expansion of your function at that alpha. Um, in any case, but all we expect from these uh, L functions, or like their logarithmic derivatives, is that there would be simple, like at least the logarithmic derivative would actually have a simple pole, and the residue of this guy can be calculated by looking at these uh, nth coefficients. So why am I saying this? Because these nth coefficients actually are fairly natural objects. So we did define them before. For an automorphic L function, when we write it as, as a Dirichlet series or, as, or an Euler product, we saw that these Okay, so what is the upshot? Okay, so for L, fix pi and S as before. Then LS 
n rho. S pi rho, we said, can be written as this, a pi rho of n over n to the s. Then the residue, and I'm assuming everything, so I assume pi is of Ramanujan type, so that the only pole, uh, so basically no poles in real part of S greater than one. Then the residue at S equals one of this D, uh, LS pi rho can be calculated as basically the limit as X goes to infinity one by X of some n less than x, a n, uh, a pi rho of n. So this is the upshot of the whole thing. In other words, n is always prime to s. Yeah. So I will put this here is 1, and here n is 1. Moreover, Okay, is this, is this clear? Because this is going to be the starting point of, the, uh, of what is going to come in the next lecture. So this is number one. And number two, a variant of this, since we weren't actually interested in the residue of the L function, but we were interested in the order of the pole of the L function, the second note is the order of the pole of the L function is actually the residue at s equals one of the negative logarithmic derivative. And under the assumptions of Ramanujan type and everything, then this can be calculated as a sum over primes. So of log p times a pi rho of p. So here is another unfortunate issue. Rho and p look the same, but rho is the dual group representation. p is a prime. So p is a prime that is not in S. Prime. Um, so m pi rho is this. These are, again, under the assumption that my pi is of Ramanujan type. This is like, I'll emphasize this once and like over and over again. If pi is not of Ramanujan type, then these limits do not exist. Like if pi is, for instance, again, the trivial representation, this limit will not exist because the main term will be of size x to the 3 halves. OK, so I'll finish by. what is expected and what one wants to do by bringing a trace formula in. So, okay, now we're getting a little bit more in the uh, concrete workable realm. Okay, so we express, we have at least a practical working expression, I would say, for the real part of, so for the, uh, the residue of the L function or the order of the uh, uh, pole of the L function. Now, why would this be any useful? This is because of the following. These a pi rho n's are actually traces of certain operators where, for which we actually can use the standard trace formula, or the stable trace formula in this case. So why any useful? Well, any of this may be useful. May be useful. And that is the following. If you look at m pi rho, I'm oh, sorry, a pi rho. And let me just do this, a pi rho of p, or n in any case, it doesn't matter. And let me just multiply these guys with uh, a certain weight so that it looks suitable for the trace formula and take a small spectral average and this actually is the trace of a certain operator. 
Uh, so let me do this. Row, comma, n to make the dependence on these two things explicit uh, on the discrete, well, maybe, I'm going to write this as Ramanujan spectrum, whatever that means, for certain test functions. Fs. Fs is compactly supported in G of As. And f rho comma n is basically a function that is going to be a product of v's that divide n of certain f of rho comma n v. And for v not dividing n, we will be taking the characteristic function, well, unit element of the Heck algebra. In other words, an expression involving a pi rows can actually be written by the geometric side of the trace formula. This, can, this is the spectral side, so we would like to actually use the uh, trace formula to bring this guy in to calculate these limits, and this will be my last words, I promise. I think I said this four times to the, already in the last 10 minutes. So. Let me just state this question and leave it at this state. Okay. So, then problem for lecture two for next time. Can we calculate some n? I mean, okay, let me just write it for n and then I'll I'll make a couple of comments here. N is relatively prime to our fixed set S, n is less than x. And we're taking a limit as x goes to infinity. This part doesn't really matter that much. Of trace of, well, R Ramanujan of Fs, F rho n by, uh, by, 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 by bringing in in the geometric side. In other words, what I'm saying is just write this as a sum over conjugacy classes or stable conjugacy classes, whichever like. I, I guess, let, let me just do conjugacy classes for this. And then we have volumes times orbital integrals of this fs times f rho n of these gammas. And note that we're taking an extra average of over n. So the game is, can you actually, because Orbital integrals and these volumes of tori, these are centralizers, are fairly concrete objects as we have seen. And can we actually do an extra averaging over n when we change the test function at for each n? And I'm going to take this next time. Well, next time will be the following. I am going to describe a couple of problems. So this is the trace formula. I'm going to describe a couple of problems. One will be related to the following fact that the, well, I'm saying that this R or right regular representation is acting on the Ramanujan spectrum, but the trace formula does not give actually a 
formula for the trace of the right regular on the Ramanujan part of the spectrum, whatever that may be. It only gives a formula for the discrete part of the spectrum. So how do you isolate the Ramanujan part? That's the, uh, number one. And number two, how, how do you even start analyzing this by the test function is varying? One thing about this test function varying is just to give you a heads up, when the test function varies, the number of terms that contribute to this sum also varies. And it gets bigger and bigger. The support of the test function gets bigger and bigger. So anyways, I'll take it, I'll take it up from this particular point, and we will specialize on GL2 to see what these terms actually may look like. Uh, for V dividing N, it really depends on it. So if N is actually P to the R, then this will be sim R of this A pi P. I mean A pi V. So these, I mean, these are not that, well, okay, so, sorry. This is a, the function whose trace is this. So you need to actually invert the Satake transform. I mean, they're, they're just some weird, yeah, it's, uh, these are the basic functions, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. We could actually, again, so the question, question is, instead of taking the limit, why don't we just like, you know, look at this and ask for the asymptotic behavior as we have done over here, and that is exactly what we're going to do, yeah. The limit makes things a little bit more pleasant because it kills all the terms that are of order less than x, but yeah, at the end of the day, you need the asymptotic behavior. Oh, sorry. Thank <laughs> you.